that wasn't the right button. <laughs> hello, hello, I am messing this up. It's been too long. Hello. Oh, it's been so long since I've been on stream. I think three or four weeks at this point, because the holidays, I am just not used to getting set up for this. I was so flustered getting in here. I was basically like running up to my computer as the countdown is going down. Ah. <sighs> Hi guys, how is everyone doing? How was your holidays and whatnot? Um, I don't know if you guys do like New Year's resolutions or anything like that. I'm really big on New Year's resolutions. Hey, Smoloki, Happy New Year! And the clean, welcome! Did you guys have a good holiday? Good New Year? I didn't really do anything for the New Year. Uh, my, hey Malcolm, welcome to the stream. We are going to be even using XR tools, although not really doing anything super interesting with it, but it will be used. Um, yeah, in the new year, my, my older daughter was really committed to the idea that she was going to stay up until midnight. And uh, I guess she and my wife did. I couldn't stay up till midnight. <laughs> That's too late for me. The girls wake me up in the morning around 5 a.m. every day. And uh, yeah, if I'm going to be waking up at 5 a.m., I have to go to sleep earlier than midnight. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, I'm real big on New Year's resolutions. So one of them, which I've been talking about a lot. Hey, Nyanel, welcome to the stream. Nyanel, did you see that I posted a video on my Polish channel? As one of the only people here who's also aware of that channel. <laughs> hey, Slacks, welcome to the stream. Um, but one of my one of my New Year's resolutions, which I've been posting about a lot la uh, lately, like all over the place, uh, is that I want to try to make one game dev prototype per month. Uh, because uh, last year in particular, but just in general, I tend to do a lot of game programming, but not game design. And forcing myself to prototype something, which is like make the minimal possible thing to test out an idea, uh, and getting into like a regular practice of just doing that all the time, I think would, would get me doing more game design, which I really want to do. I have roosters as daughters. No, because roosters wake up when the sun comes up at 5 a.m. It's still dark. <laughs> They're worse than roosters. <laughs> um, but they're lovely. I love my daughters. They just, they, uh, even though they're relatively old now, like, you know, babies mess with parents' sleep. Uh, they they definitely like just wreak havoc on my my sleep ability. Um, what was I saying before? Oh, the one prototype per month thing. So um, the prototypes that I'm working on for this month, uh, there's some ideas I want to explore with um, uh, like inventory management and weapon switching, uh, which I was originally going to work on that for this prototype, but it turned out like I, I started working on it. I'm like, this is just too big. I need to narrow it down. Uh, so now what I'm working on um, is just to see if it feels good to shoot with a uh, weapon attached to the top of your hand, uh, because that's kind of what I want to do with this weapon switching inventory thing. I want you to, to, to get things out of your inventory by looking at your hands like this and attach them to your hand to use like this. Um, but I actually have no idea if it'll feel good holding your hands in this kind of shape to shoot. Um, because you got the VR controller, which is really perfect for shooting like a, a gun like this. The information that you get from the API is actually like a ray pointing out from your controller like it's a gun. Um, but so then in this mode, you would be holding it this way. And I don't know if that will feel good to, to shoot, if you'll be able to aim decently in that way. So that's, that's the thing that I'm trying to test. Have you considered doing something for the 2023 Global Game Jam at the end of the month? Yes, actually. There is a, um, a local site for it in Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, which is about a 30-minute drive from where I live. Uh, and I'm going to go. Uh, Logan, who uh, may come to the stream, he sometimes comes to the streams, um, he, I think, was the one who who put me onto this, actually. Something he said on, on Twitter, Discord, or somewhere. Um, and then the other Logan, who uh, I worked with on that first-person shoveling game, <laughs> is going to be there. So yeah, I'm going to go do that. I'm going to uh, do the two days or whatever. Um, man, I'm missing a lot of chats here. I made a comeback. I did not really make a comeback, Nino. I just like got really tired of all of the comments about either me being dead or that I stole everyone's money. 
Um, <laughs> and I, w I wanted to make a video to like just tell everyone like, hey, I'm not dead. <laughs> Here's what actually happened to me. Um, and Happy New Year, Ricardo. Welcome to the stream. 52 comments. Yeah, it was the comments for the most part really nice and like really kind of make me want to post some more videos on that channel every once in a while. <laughs> Uh, Bastian's video on the uh, XR tools. Did I miss something you said earlier, Slacks? Uh, but yeah, I did. I watched uh, the second part of Bastian's video this morning while I was doing my workout. I do like a cardio workout in the morning. Um, yeah, two hating comments. But you know what? Like uh, one of them is actually from a person I know. Like I, they, they were part of the um, the Kickstarter, and like I talked to them in voice chat a bunch of times, and like so. Okay, I felt. The person, this person in particular had a personal connection and I can understand why you would be angry, right? Or why this person would be angry. So I felt fine addressing it. Um, the other hating comment, I think, are you talking about the one where they're saying like, oh, well, does this just mean I can unsubscribe now? <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's also fine. Um, anyway, uh, how are your guys' holidays? Do you guys have any, are any uh, New Year's resolutions? I'm just like a mad person with New Year's resolutions. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I think that's that's really all that's going on. Oh, one more thing that's going on with me. Two more things that's going on with me. Um, I uh, For the holidays, I went to go visit my pa. And I've mentioned this before, but he's gotten like really into VR, which is crazy because he's never played any video games before. But VR, for whatever reason, has just clicked with him and he's really into it. So he got a, a new gaming PC, <laughs> which is a crazy thing to think about. You know, he's in his 70s and, and, and buying a gaming PC uh, with a, a uh, 3060 Ti in it. And I still am rocking my 1070 from however many years ago. I think from 2016 or something like that, I got it. Um, and playing Half-Life Alex uh, on his rig with that 3060 Ti was so amazing that yesterday when the 4070 Ti came out, I ordered it. So that's coming, and I'm excited about that. And the other possibly interesting thing that I want to share with you guys is I got this cool... Um, head strap for my Quest Pro because the Quest Pro doesn't have a head strap and I've had this thing since I don't know when did it come out in October and I've just been struggling with making it comfortable for me uh, and this head strap is amazing if anyone else has a Quest Pro and um, is also having comfort issues let me know and I'll put the link in there it's like just some guy who makes accessories for Quest things like the the plastic parts on here are very clearly printed with a 3d printer <laughs> <laughs> but it works amazing. It's really great. You had a, a ter you had a, a crappy Christmas slacks. I'm sorry to hear that. I mean, I guess you know Christmas is a very mixed time. I think part of the, something when crappy things happen on Christmas too, it also feels like worse than if crappy things had happened any other time because you have that expectation to go with Christmas. Anyway, uh, yeah, let's let's hack on some things. Uh, it's so great to be back here. Oh, COVID, man. It's so great to be back here. It's so great to have everyone on and chat with you guys again. I have missed it. And I'm drinking tea because I'm kind of tired. <laughs> let me show you um, Let me show you what I got so far. Because uh, I have kind of the basics in there. And uh, yeah, I'll show you what I've got and explain what I'd like to work on today. Just give me a second to get my uh, Quest 2 on. All right, I'm almost back in business here. I just realized too that I haven't I haven't opened up the um the casting. Ah, oh, come on. I have like the multiple accounts thing set up and so I'm trying to enter my uh my shape here to unlock my account. Um so give me a second. There's just a lot of little random things need to be done to get going and then after that we'll be rocking. We'll be hacking up a storm here. Uh, what is it? It's oculus.com slash cast. And I have to connect the headset to my computer here to deploy. It's in the title, so I'm sure you guys are aware, but we are using Godot 4 for this. There is a weird bug. Maybe you'll even get to see it right now. Yep. 
I've been meaning to make an issue for this. There might be one existing already, but for whatever reason, when I do a Android build, when it launches, you know, Gradle and, and does this stuff, uh, for some reason, it like stops the process. And then I have to go in here and I have to foreground it. If I background it, it'll just keep stopping over and over again. So it's a weird bug. It, it's something that just happens uh, when doing this type of Android build. All right, so that is going to deploy on the headset. We can kind of watch the messages down here. Yep, looks like it is running, assuming there wasn't some kind of error. And where are my controllers? <laughs> Here's one. And I will get casting going in a second. All right, let's take a peek. All right, if I can find my other hand here. Uh, I have got hands. They're animated with the normal XR tool stuff. I have these little tank looking things on the top of my hands, which are going to be the weapons. And I can shoot like little laser beams out of them. I don't know if you can see it on the video, but there is like, actually I'll do it closer. There is um, an aiming dot, uh, which I don't know that I'll actually have in the game, but I wanted to have there uh, to make sure that everything was working right. So I actually have a button you can turn off the aiming dot. Um, and you know, the question is, can I actually aim these things? Because um, I know from playing different VR games, uh, when you have guns, sometimes the sights don't actually work, like they're just there for show, uh, and sometimes they do work and they're great and you can aim. Um, but like, can you pick a point and hit it? I'm trying to do the corners of this box. Yeah, I'm doing medium well. Um, but what I think I want to try to add today, because the only way to know if it feels good to shoot these things is to have something to shoot at. <laughs> so I'm thinking what we'll make is uh, an enemy. We'll make like a sphere uh, that moves around. I'm thinking uh, we'll make like a state machine. We'll have uh, three states, a state where it kind of hovers in one spot, a state where it's transitioning to a new spot, and um, like a knockback state when we hit it. And yeah, I think that should be approachable for a stream. What do you guys think? <laughs> yeah, it's a short video, Nyanel. All of uh, three minutes. Yeah, and if you guys are doing uh, any kind of prototyping or um, that sort of thing, uh, I would love for you to join my one prototype per month extravaganza. I should have said that in the beginning when I was introing the thing. Got to admit, you kind of went out of shape a bit when it comes to Polish. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I still listen to um, Polish and read Polish, but I, I don't speak it like ever. I haven't had a conversation with someone in Polish like, a real conversation in years, maybe, I don't know, five years, something like that. So I am super rusty. Um, what am I looking for? All right, so here's our main scene. Let's start making uh, this enemy guy. Um, because this is a prototype, I'm just going to make a sphere. Oh yeah, the clean, what is, what is your prototype? You should definitely like share about it on, on Discord too. So I'm thinking this is, uh, I made it a node 3D. I'm going to make it a character body. And I actually haven't done a lot of character bodies in uh, Godot 4 yet. So this will be a relearning experience for me. Um, so we need a collision shape. Oh, actually, let's not start with the collision shape. Let's start uh, with the uh, mesh instance. The sort of Polish, the sort of Polish Discord Godot server turned out to be a political nightmare. Oh, geez, I have to really carefully create my own Polish server in the future. Yeah, that's a thing that happens on the internet. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. I I haven't actually spent a lot of time paying attention to what's going on there, just because I'm limited in time in general. Um, I also don't know. Like, is it the same group of people on the Polski channel in the normal Godot Discord? And I'd kind of like to put a 
like a prototype material on here as opposed to a solid color. Uh, for whatever reason, I think that would work better for an enemy. So let's, I got uh, all of the Kenny um, prototype texture pack textures in here. So let's find one that looks nice. Let's see what this looks like. Uh, I think we might want to scale it to make those um, to make uh, those boxes happen more frequently. So I think we would. What happens if you make it triplanar? Ooh. That is weird. <laughs> I don't think we actually want to do that. Uh, we just want to scale it. Uh, what direction would that be? It would be scaling smaller or bigger? Bigger, I guess. There we go. Maybe double that? Yeah. I guess I'll have to see what that looks like at a distance. Might be too much. Might have to go back to the 2x. That's looking pretty good. And yeah, I guess we'll save this. We'll call it enemy. Let's generate a collision. No, I'm just gonna add a collision shape. Usually what I do um, you know, is make the mesh and then generate the collision shape, but it's such a simple collision shape. Um, it's literally the default sphere. So let's just do this. Uh, oh, I grabbed the 2D one, not the 3D one. Collision shape 3D. Sphere and it's the perfect size because it's the default. <laughs> Ooh, Ricardo's working on a box 2D GD extension, uh, but continuing on a 3D prototype soon. Cool. There was someone who made a box 2D uh, GD native uh, plugin that was, I, I thought, really well done. I didn't spend a lot of time with it. Um, I wonder if there's an opportunity to to collaborate there. Uh, Nano says this, or no, that was already there. Okay, actually not. It's not an official Polish server. It's just a small community that formed up from one fellow who's a Godot enthusiast, but it's a mess. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe the Polsky channel is the the place to hang out rather than, than the the Discord. Was it Godot cheek? I got it a little bit down on my Discord. Where is it? Where'd it go? What'd you guys change the icon to? Oh no, it's still same icon, just much further down than I remember it. Uh, all right, so why are you still giving me these? This node is no shape. It does have a shape. Added one. What are you talking about? Consider adding a collision shape 3D to define its shape. What did I do wrong here? Oh, I made this do a character body 2D. All right, change type. Character body 3D. There we go. Now all is right with the world. And yeah, so let's drop this into the main scene to get, or I suppose actually the world, to get a kind of idea of the perspective. Or not perspective, I'm sorry, the idea of scale. Ooh, that's actually quite big, but that's good. That's good. It means I can put it kind of far away. I'll have to see in the headset how, um, how that feels. Maybe we'll... Come all the way out here. Yeah, actually, I might just take a quick look at what that is like in the headset to see um, kind of how big it is. Here it comes. It's still a little big. Maybe move it a little bit further back. Let's do top view here. Maybe if we can get it kind of here when we're talking about the whole plane. See what that looks like in perspective. Ooh, that might be too far now. Let's try it. I kind of need to know how far away it's going to be and how big it's going to be to decide how much it should move. Which is what we're going to be doing here. 
Oh, that's actually great. That is great. Although my laser doesn't shoot that far. <laughs> my laser only shoots 10 meters. Um, I'll need to increase the, the length of the laser. We can do that right away. Ooh, there's some serious compression distortion on uh, the view you guys are seeing. I am not seeing that. It looks beautiful on my end. As beautiful as that prototype scene can look. Uh, so let's go to the blaster. Uh, we can lengthen it by, I think, just increasing the length of the raycast. I think that will work. Let's make it 30 meters. And go look at the script real quick. So the aiming dot is placed by uh, the raycast and its collision point. And the laser beam, which is just a, a box mesh with um, an unshaded box mesh, uh, we are resizing it to the laser length. And then this 10 is for when uh, we're not hitting anything. And I think that's fine. It doesn't really need to go very far to just kind of show you where you shot. Um, so let's give this a try. See if I can hit that thing. Oop, I gotta switch over to here. So you guys can see it. Yeah, I can hit it kind of just, I don't know if it's just barely, because I can't tell now that I just said like, well, the laser doesn't need to go that far. Okay, we're going to make the um, the no-hit laser go the full 30 meters, just so I can get an idea of um, of the length. And actually, you know what we can do here? We can get the length from the raycast, so they will always be in sync. Uh, what is that property called on the Raycast? Uh, Raycast 3D, it is target position, target position, and length. All right, let's deploy that. This is kind of nice, like, deploying and trying things a lot. I feel like the last bunch of streams were just so deep and, like, writing C++ code, and then maybe we'd be able to run it by, by the end of the stream. It's nice having this this back and forth here. Oh, and I realized 9L said some stuff I will I will check out in a moment. Ooh. Ooh, some weirdness happening. Can you guys see that, or is it just me? Oh, that's not right. I think there's some other property I need to adjust, because, like, the, the missing laser is going straight through the thing. Um... Oh yeah, I probably have to divide the the length by two for the position. Um, yeah, so I'm multiplying by a literal 0.5 here. Uh, so let's actually, we will say uh, a temporary variable so we don't have to grab the length twice. Copy and paste a little bit of code that's grabbing the length of the target position vector from the raycast. And uh, this will be ray length. So we can multiply. Uh, we're multiplying the forward, um, or actually, we're negating it. This is actually the backward vector from the laser beam's transform by half the ray length because uh, meshes are positioned uh, from the center. And then make it be the length of the ray here. All right, does that make sense? Cannot infer type. Why not? Length should be a float. Okay. Looks good. All right, so what did I miss? Ooh, I missed some stuff from Ricardo, too. And Malcolm, I think you want to make the root node a rigid body 3D or a character body 3D. Oh, yeah, that was from when I was confused about it being a, a 2D node. Yeah. You caught it before I did, Malcolm. Uh, I want to try a new method of typing using controller analogs. I got inspired by old cell phones. New method of typing using controller analogs. I am really curious what you mean by that. That sounds super interesting, but I, I just don't 
I can't quite picture it in my head. Um, I'd love if you could share a little bit more about that. I know the moderation was split. The only good publishing company being Polish as well that offers console support. Its owner says that the administration there is not professional. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, the 4070 Ti has 12 gigs. It's coming on next Wednesday. So I can tell you guys uh, how it works on the next stream. I'm so excited to see what Half-Life Alex looks through it. And also, uh, during the Steam sale, Cyberpunk 2077 was half off for 30 bucks, And I've already bought that game two times. I bought it for the PlayStation 4 and for the Xbox. I most recently played through it again on the Xbox. So I was like, I don't want to buy that again. But the VR mod, I so want to be in that world. It would be so amazing. But with my... 1070 it runs at like 30 frames per second and looks just like garbage so when i get that 10 or 4070 ti i'm totally going back into cyberpunk 2077 and try and see if i can take in that beautiful neon dystopia uh so what was i doing i was launching it on the headset Let's see if we can it's still not working hmm did it maybe not launch? Did I forget to save something? Uh, we'll go in here and just save one extra time. That seems good. Let me hit this guy. And we'll see what happens. All right. No, it's still not working. What am I doing wrong? Huh. It's such a silly thing to get stuck on. Okay, so we are positioning the laser beam at the same position as the start of the raycast. Then we are moving it along the z-axis of the ray for half of the ray length and then setting the mesh size to the ray length, like the z on the, on the laser beam mesh. That seems correct. Did you enjoy the game? You're talking about Cyberpunk 2077? I love that game. I know it got a lot of uh, crap at launch and whatnot, but even playing through it on a base PlayStation 4, uh, I had a great time. Ray length divided by 5. Ray length divided by 5. Oh, I wrote ray length divided by 5. <laughs> Whew. Thank you, Malcolm. You are a genius. I I did not see that at all. It's stream brain. That's what it is. Uh, I get about 50% as smart when I'm on stream, but you guys help me make up for it by, <laughs> by uh, having uh, an extra pair of eyes. It's pair programming. It's or crowd programming, maybe, with a group of people. Yeah, there was a five there originally, and my brain just did not see that that wasn't a two. Perfect. All right, so I can see it's just kind of barely going past the um, the object. But you know what we could do? We could keep it at the same uh, Z, and then when we're having it move around, we could just move it along the, um, the X and Y axes uh, to, make things, to make things easier. Because it's really just a question of... Can I aim and hit it? Although, no, that's not going to work because I want it to have knockback. I want you to feel a little bit that you're hitting it. So, yeah. Okay, let's make the, the laser a little bit longer. Let's make it... Um, let's actually look at how far away this is in the world. Uh, so if I hit my numpad 7. I don't know if I told you guys about this, but I got a little USB number pad to go by my left hand. Because I don't know why number pads are traditionally on the right. It makes no sense for right-handed people because that's where the mouse is. So having a number pad on the left 
I am a, I'm a big fan. I highly recommend it. Okay, so this is are those groups of 10? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Yeah, it looks like it. Okay, so this is... This is um, 10, 20, 30, 40. Yep. So let's make it... Let's just say it's 50. I don't care. There's no problem with making it long that I can think of right now. Um, let's make this ray negative 50. Or are those groups of 10? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. They're groups of 8. Um, yeah, we'll do one last try on this, and then we'll start actually writing the, uh, uh, the state machine. And I won't be able to use my state machine uh, code that I usually use. I have my own like personal little state machine add-on. Uh, because I haven't ported it to Godot 4 yet. And we could do that on stream, but I don't really want to. I want to focus on things that get us decently quick results. Okay, that's shooting way past it, which is beautiful. And I can just sort of miss it by a hair, which is also quite nice for our purposes. There's some weird thing going on since the last two or three times that I ran it that like the left and right eye are slightly out of sync. I don't know what that's about. I'm going to try this all the way go back to the home oh no it's fine here okay hopefully when we go into it again we won't have that it's really unnerving hey Winfrey welcome to the stream happy new year to you as well <laughs> 50 or 20 percent yeah clean on old phones to type a we used to press two once 999 for z yeah i hated that <laughs> the same idea but with analogs move left analog up twice for b right analog down four times for z that's interesting that's really interesting that actually kind of makes me think of uh and i never actually looked it up but i listened to the um the Coffee with Butterscotch podcast, which is a game dev podcast uh, done by the uh, Butterscotch Shenanigans studio. It's three brothers. Um, and they were talking about some input system where you would like basically put your hands like in it like this, and then each finger was by a joystick. And like pressing like a joystick up would be one letter and down would be another letter. And I don't know, the idea was you could type faster this way or something. Um, but it kind of makes me think of that. But yeah, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. It also kind of makes me think of, um, I had a Commodore 64 growing up. Um, and rather than having, you know, like the, the three arrow keys like this, it had two arrow keys and you would access, uh, like, it would, like I forget what it was, but you would press the one to go up and then you would hold shift to press the same key to go down. <laughs> And it was a very interesting movement scheme that at the time I was totally used to. Like, I was a master of that. Um, but yeah, it kind of makes me think of that as well. Anyway, I'm excited to see... I'm excited to see what you do with that. That sounds really interesting. All right, so... Uh, we're going to write a bunch of code for a bit. I think I'm actually going to take off the headset so I don't crush my head uh, while we're writing this little state machine. All right. And let's go over to our enemy scene. Let's rename this node enemy. Attach a script. Enemy GD. Jump over here to VS Code. Actually, I'm going to save this real quick. VS Code acts very strange when uh, you're working on a scene that isn't saved. So I just. Jumping ahead of some weird problems we may or may not have. Ooh, and it added all this stuff to character body, which I definitely don't want in this case. So we'll delete most of it. We can keep the physics process. We'll declare a num for the states. We're going to have an idle state where it's just chilling. We have a moving state. And what will we call the, like, when it's hit state? Um, it's called hurt. And then we're going to say um, we need a variable first to hold the state. Hang on. Our state, it's an int equals state idle. And 
how are we going to structure this? I feel a little lost, like not having my little state machine code that I use. Um, so when we're idle, when we first enter idle, we want to um, we want to randomly pick a period of time to um, to wait. So how are we going to manage the entering exiting states here? Let's add a change state function. In Godot fourth, I think you can use the enum type rather than in now. Really? Let me try that. Ooh. <laughs> Thanks, Malcolm. That's awesome. Yeah, there's so much in Godot 4, like, I use Godot 4 every day, right? Uh, mostly not making games, but like hacking on, on, on things for Godot 4 or in Godot 4, but there's still like so much in it that I don't know what it is. Okay, so we're going to do something like, uh, yeah, so we'll have a match statement here. And we won't set the state until the very end so that we'll be able to see what the previous state is. So down here we'll say state equals p new state. And we're going to start with idle. And here we are going to start a timer, but we need a timer. And we'll call this, I guess, idle timer. Uh, and we don't need to set up too much in advance other than I think we want it to happen on the physics process because we're going to kind of synchronize everything on physics. Um, which reminds me, uh, I think that I have the physics tick set to 60, which I don't want. Um, does XR tools do anything to, um, to like reset the physics rate to be the frame rate of the headset? I think that would be a good thing to do. <laughs> Um, where do you set the physics process rate common physics sticks? So I don't know, I think I probably want this to be 72, but I actually don't know what the headset is in. Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll mess with that more later. Let's just, I guess, focus on, on making this enemy. So, uh, when we enter the idle state... We want to randomly pick a wait time, which, uh, what is the best way to do this? Rand F range. We will stay for at least two seconds and up to five seconds. Um, and I guess we can set this right on the timer itself. Idle timer. I think it's wait times the property, right? I didn't just make that up, I think. Wait time. And so I just rearrange some windows here real quick. Actually, I'll move this one all the way to the end. OK. Um, and then we will start it. And then we need to do something on timeout. So. Um, I guess we need to make sure that we're still in the idle state because um, we maybe could have switched states uh, when we get hurt. Again, another reason why I like using my library because we would have had you know an enter and exit method on each state and could have done things like stop the idle timer. Um, but that's fine. We're we're kind of hacking our way through this. This is a prototype. Um, so we're gonna say if a state equals state idle, then we are going to change the state to uh, move state moving. And we'll add some stuff in there to randomly pick a new position and, and move to it. But what else do we need to do here? the idle state. I think we're good, actually. 
I think we're good. All right, let's move on to entering the moving state. So we need to pick a new position, uh, which actually we're going to need to store in a variable here. So we'll say um, we'll say moving to position, and this will be a vector three. So we need to randomly find this moving to position, which we're going to get by getting the current position. So that'd be transform or do you want to do this globally? I think we do want to do it globally. So global global position. I was going to do global transform dot origin, but I'll take a global position if we have one. Plus um, a random vector. Is, are there methods to do random vectors? That would be kind of cool. Otherwise, we'll just just make one. Um, Yeah, we'll just make one. That's fine. Uh, so then that's vector three, and we need to do uh, rand f range. We'll go from let's say let it move up to five meters in any direction. So we'll say five to five. Repeat that a couple times. And I think that's enough for the entering the state. Oh, hang on. If you're using the Godot OpenXR FP controller node, then it does set the physics right. So I'm in Godot 4. Um, is that still a thing? Is the FP controller node still a thing? So I mean, that was in, yeah, I mean, I don't even have an add-on for OpenXR because it's all built in. Yeah, 9L also, or no, not, not, I thought 9L was also telling me that it was in num in, in 4, but no, in, in Godot 3, you just have to use integers. Yeah, I mean, Winfrey, we are doing a, a state machine, but just a, a, a handmade, crappy, hacky one with switch statements. One of these days, I'll port the one that I have from Godot 3, uh, the nicer one that I have from Godot 3 that formalizes it a bunch, then I can take advantage of that. All right, so on the physics process, if we are in the moving state, let's get this thing moving, then we are going to, I guess, move and slide, which I don't remember exactly how you do that in Godot 4. Let me just bring up the um, character body. I know that you set some... Ah, oh, not 2D. You set some stuff on uh, member variables. Yeah, so we're probably setting the velocity. The up direction is good for us. What does move and slide actually take? It takes nothing. <laughs> all right, yeah, I think all we have to do is set the velocity. So... How are we going to do this? We need a speed constant, which we're just going to pick some random value for because I'm not good at logicking my way through things uh, in advance. We'll figure it out as we're writing the math. Um, so we need to say velocity. Oh, and do we, does velocity have to be multiplied by delta or no? That was like typically meters per second. Okay, so it doesn't need to be multiplied by um, the delta because it's already in meters per second. So I guess, yeah, um, we would take... We would take our current... We would take the moving to position, subtract the current position to get our vector, which maybe we should even... Have just stored that to be honest but um yeah maybe we should just say moving vector rather than a position and then an amount of time hmm let's stick with this approach for now uh we do have to generate this vector though so 
movement vector equals moving to position minus our global position, uh, which uh, we then say velocity, or and we need to normalize this. Normalized. So then our movement vector times our speed, unless we're close enough to it that we just go there, right? <laughs> so how do we determine if we're close enough already? Would that be, um, hang on. Um, that would be something like, if if movement vector length is less than speed, then we're just going to move um, No, how do we determine this? Because I, I don't know if you guys are picturing the same problem that I am. Uh, I can I can draw a picture. Uh, da, da, da. So we have our, why aren't you writing? What's going on here? Okay, I see what the problem is. Hold. I need to rerun this little script I have that sets up my drawing tablet here. So this would be try monitor with tablet stream. Go. Is it working now? Yes, it is. So we have our, our sphere, and it's moving to this point. At some point, it's going to get real close to that point. Or actually, we're, we're thinking about the center, so actually it's, it would be like the, the, the sphere is here with its center there. So it just needs to go this teeny tiny distance, and if moving at our speed would take us past the point, we're just going to keep oscillating back and forth. Um, so maybe doing a direction and a time is better. Maybe we pick a direction and pick a random amount of time to go in that direction, which we could derive from a new position, right? We just have to do a little bit of division. Um, so if we pick a moving to position, And then we would say moving vector um hang on, hang on. If we do moving vector is this random vector maybe call it moving delta. I need a name for the normalized vector as well. Naming is hard. Um, so we need a moving delta, and then we can say moving time equals the moving delta length. Uh, and if we have meters per second, We have meters per second, meters per second, and we have a meters. Okay, let's turn this into real numbers. We're moving 10 meters per second, and we've decided we're going to move 5 meters, then the answer is that it would take 0.5 seconds to get there. So I can I can do this just by looking at the numbers. So we take the speed and divide by the distance, right? Or no, that's not quite right. Hang on. Um, no, it's the other way around. Because so five divided by ten equals 0.5 and equals 0.5. <laughs> And that's the number we want. So it's it's the reverse of this. So distance divided by speed. All right. And someone else probably got the math before me. Yep. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, thank you, Malcolm. Okay, so we are taking the um, distance divided by our speed, which is way too fast. Now that I know this is meters per second, let's go, I don't know, two meters per second? I don't know if that'll be good. We'll experiment with it. And so what we need, what we need to store in this variable up here is uh, move direction, we'll call it, which is a vector three. And the moving time, we can write directly to a timer. So yeah, we need to store the move direction, which is the normalized moving delta. Is it normalized or normalized? I think it's normalized, yeah. Okay. Um, so moving time, we need a timer to assign that to. So we'll say move timer, or no, uh, I'm looking for the timer and then I'm gonna name it. Timer, move timer. And I think the only thing we need to set is that it's one shot. Oh, and that we want to do everything on the physics tick. Okay, so let's also add the um, connect to the timeout signal right away. And we need to always check if we are still in the same state. If moving, then change state to state idle. Okay, and then we can finally get back to writing our uh, uh, physics process here which is going to set our velocity to equal um, our move direction times our speed. Oh, and I forgot to do a thing up top here too. Uh, I forgot to assign the value to the timer, which we're gonna do here. Eh. Move, move timer wait time and actually let's set this first then do our move timer start all right i think i think that's good yeah and maybe we should have made this this range be a constant too so this would be like uh const move um, move max, so we can tweak that once we get once we get going. Oops. Okay. Um, so this should be enough to see it moving around, barring any terrible mistakes I made, which um, I should see if anyone... Yeah, that's a good point, Malcolm. The random numbers may end up driving the enemy out of range. Would be better to just pick a target XYZ in global coordinates known to be in the player's shooting gallery region. Yeah, yeah, or clamp the... um the position uh, on, you know, the front and back z-axis, um, that's definitely something we should do. Uh, for now, I just want to see if this is going to work. Oh, and it's complaining about this type being different. Let's put our num types in here. What's it complaining about over here? Let's get down to no warnings, no errors, and then try it. And then uh, we... Well, I think actually I would like to add the hurt state first, and then we'll come back to, to uh, your point, Malcolm, to, to try and limit it to um, a particular range. Uh, maybe we could even put like a, a, a collision shape that we can paint in the editor as a way to easily define what that box is that we want the enemies to stay within. 
Okay, this seems good. Barring first contact with the computer. Let me get the headset back on so we can try it. And my controllers. Oh, what did I do wrong? There we go. Got itch on my nose. Gets itchy in this thing. All right. Uh, here we go. Let's. Wait, I got to deploy first. Let's deploy. Let's jump over here. I'll get casting going again in a second. Did, did it work? All right, okay. So either I totally messed something up or it is very paused right now because we are not getting anything. Oh, I forgot a very critical step. We have to change state in the ready function. <laughs> we have to change state when we load. Um, so let's do func ready change state to state idle. That should kick everything off. That should be good. All right. Hey, there it goes. It goes with absolutely no sense of urgency. It'd be great to have some easing, um, especially on the beginning movement, to have it move a little quicker at the beginning of the movement. And um, you know what? Should we have done this with a tween? <laughs> no, that wouldn't work right because we want to use the, the collision, uh, the, um, the physics engine check collision stuff. But the basics is working. Um, I think it needs to be a little bit faster and move. Well, that's actually a really long distance. That's a pretty good distance. I think a little bit faster is the, uh, the main thing. And we won't mess around with easing quite yet. So let's Crank the speed up. Oh, and actually the idle wait time should have a constant too. Um, idle max, set that. Or we'll do an idle min and an idle max because we have both those in there. Ah. Okay, and let's make the speed bigger. We'll follow the Sid Meier rule. Uh, when, you're, when you're trying out new things, either double or half the value. So we will double it. Well, that's still, it's still kind of, uh, I don't know. That's pretty good. It's hard enough to track it. Um, I wonder if we should have a minimum distance that it can move. Cause it's really uninteresting when it moves just like a tiny bit. Um, how would we do that, though, if we were to have a minimum distance? I mean, we could do a loop and reject all of the move deltas that are below a certain length. That's probably like the brute force way to do it. I don't know if there's a better way to do it. Um, I don't feel like thinking about it too hard. So let's say we have a move min of 2... 
we're going to uh all right i guess make this be a zero length vector and then we can say while moving delta length is less than move min we just keep generating them uh, the brute force way. <laughs> Polar coordinates, pick a random angle in the distance. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a really good idea, Malcolm. Um, yeah. I'm going to add a little to-do about that. I don't, I don't want to implement that right now because, again, I'm just going for, like, quick and dirty, but uh, that's, a, that's a great way to do that. So um, instead, pick a uh, direction and distance to uh, ensure move min in a less brute forcey way. <laughs> All right, so this should work. The speed, I don't know. Let's double it again. Good old Sid Meier taking us into dangerous territory here. What do you got for me, floating guy? Ooh, that is much speedier. Stay still quite too long. Um, and the movement distance isn't that interesting either. Uh, okay, let's 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 double some numbers here. Um, we're gonna say. The idle is just too long in general. Let's say one, two, I don't know, three seconds. We'll sort of have those numbers. And the movements, let's double those. So now our min is almost as high as our previous max. We'll see what that what that feels like. And then the interesting thing will be putting a whole bunch of them in there together. Maybe not too many. We don't want to be shooting fish in a barrel. Maybe put three of them. Oh, man. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that is way better as far as gameplay-wise. Maybe it still hangs in one spot a little too long. Although, I don't know. That was... With the knockback, though, the hanging in one spot is going to be less of an issue because it's going to move... Um. Oh, I think it's about to go off the edge of the world. <laughs> we do need to implement uh, Malcolm's bounding box there. No, this is good. This is good. This is good for our purposes, for sure. All right. Uh, what's next? I think the the knockback is probably next. Um, I'm wondering if the the physics process could share the same code for the moving and the hurt. I think actually it probably can. Anyway, um, so how are we gonna do this? Or actually, wait, hang on. Let me let me commit this. I have a good batch of working code here. Let's commit it. Take a quick uh, look at the diff. Make sure I'm not putting anything wacky in here. I don't know about this, me messing with the physics ticks, but I guess I'll leave it for now. It's not too wacky. Uh, added simple enemy that moves around. All right, now let's make it so we can hit him. Uh, so how are we gonna do that? We, the blaster knows when it's hit something. Uh, so what I think we're going to do is when the blaster detects that it's hit something, it's going to check if it has a particular method on it and then call that method. Um, so in here, we know we're hitting something in this part. 
And how are we going to calculate where it moves to? I guess a useful thing for the thing getting hit to know would be the vector on which it was hit. I don't think the collision point matters too much. But um, let's say um, is colliding, and then there's some raycast method. What's the crowd is saying? Should the sphere be a bit closer? The laser on the hand seems uh, like a quick, close-range weapon to me. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Um, particularly once we start knocking it back, uh, that could become an issue. We might want to give the enemy like an imperative to come towards us, actually. Um, and then we're when we hit it, we're we're pushing it back a little bit. Um, that could be interesting too. Let's let's get the knockback in, and then we'll have kind of the whole picture of how we're interacting with the enemy. Uh, and then we can we can tweak from there. This is the joy of prototyping, though, by the way. Like, I have no idea what this is going to be. <laughs> we just put some things in a pot and see, uh, see how it feels and then adjust. Okay, so we need to get from the Raycast. Uh, what is it? It's get collider. Get collider. All right. So we'll say var collider. And we'll say if collider has method, uh, we'll say hurt. Then it's going to call it collider hurt. And we want to give it the vector from which we hit it. Uh, so that will be actually the same as Well, it doesn't need to be the exact vector we hit it, although it would be kind of nice for it to be. Um, but would it be the same as the vector of the raycast? Yeah, I think so. I think the raycast vector normalized the target the target point on the raycast. I think that's the... Or no, because it needs to be uh, transformed per the raycast. So that would be, I guess... Um, Raycast global transform times. Can I do in GDScript just multiply them? I'm not sure. I mean, that's what I would do in C++, but uh, normalized. Then we can go over to our enemy. We can add a... Uh, Hurt method, which gets the, um, we'll say, collision vector. And the main thing we need to do is change state to um, state hurt. But we could also set the move direction. This is making me happier that we switch to a move direction rather than like a destination point. Can equal the collision vector, uh, which could be interesting. You could hit it sort of at a different angle and and maybe get uh, affected a little bit differently. And when we move, change into the state hurt. Um, I guess we're just going to make the assumption that the move direction is already set. Again, I would love a little more formalism here, but we're doing it the hacky way. You can also pass in get collision normal. The normal on the objects so when you shoot the enemy from the bottom, it would be blown up. Ooh, yes. Yes, let's do that. Thanks, Malcolm. And then is this... Um, is this normal? I would expect this normal to be reversed, right? It's pointing the opposite. It's pointing towards where we hit it. So for us, well, hang on. How about we say, we could say the hurt method takes a collision normal and then transforms it. Or... We could transform it here. And then how do we reverse a vector? Do we just negate it? 
Does that make sense? Let me draw a picture. Pictures answer everything. Um, so if we have a vector, it's pointed this way, that's like, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. The reverse is this way. Yeah, that is just negative 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Let's pick a different one. Maybe like here. Uh, it's basically the same damn vector. <laughs> Let's try that. We'll just try negating it and see what that does. All right, and the hurt state, really all it needs to do is set a timer of a hurt timer. And this one's going to have a fixed wait time. So we'll just start it. This state, we can say if state in state moving or state hurt, and we use the same logic. Um, we need to add that hurt timer. I always do that. Type the name that I want to give it rather than the, uh, the name of the node. And this shouldn't last much at all. Um, we want it to be quick and sudden, uh, let's start with 0.3. It's one shot. We are going to uh, set hurt timer timeout. Um, and I'm going to default to uh, switching back to idle, although that might make for like really lame enemies. <laughs> it's um, it might be more interesting to have them immediately move after they've been hit, but let's let's try this first. We'll switch to idle. And oh, we do need to do a different speed. Uh, so we'll say const hurt speed. And it should be much faster. Uh, let's quadruple it. Let's say 32. See what it does. Um, and we need to change that here. So we could say speed if state equals state moving, else hurt speed. I'm going to put this in parens so it's a little bit easier for me to recognize what's happening at a quick glance. Um, I think this should be good. Let's give it a try. We'll see if my thinking about the collision normal that we needed to invert it is correct, because I may have that backwards. But I always think of normals as pointing out, and we need to move the opposite direction. All right, he was getting real close to me. I have to hit him first. Ooh, did I hit him? <laughs> I don't even know. I don't know if I'm hitting him or if he's just moving. Oh, that looked like a hit because he's moving real fast. The collision direction doesn't seem right, like the movement direction that he's doing. He's out of range. He's totally out of range. Okay. Um, we may need to add the thing limiting his movement sooner than I'd expected. But uh, let's just, for now, try increasing it to... Uh, da, 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 da. Let's try increasing it to 100 just for the heck of it so I can get an I can just quick get an idea of what's happening uh, with the collision with the the direction that it's moving when it gets hurt it seems wrong uh, at least so far Ooh, it's moving on the ground there yeah it's moving just wrong well oh, that time it was close you know what I think it's the normal of the face that it's hitting um, and that's not what we want at all. Uh, that doesn't help us. 
I think the thing I had originally might be closer. It still might be wrong, <laughs> what I had, but I, I think it might be closer. Um, so what was that? It was like collision <clears throat> vector equals the raycast 3D global transform times the raycast 3D target position. Let's give that a shot. I was in here for a second. Hmm. Was that us? Did we do that? Anything in the debug? Failed to acquire swap chain. All right, something happened, but I don't think it was. Uh, I don't think it was our code in this project's fault. Could certainly be a bug in Godot's WebXR support, but. Okay. Whoa! <laughs> I blasted it into oblivion! Oh, we needed to normalize that. <laughs> I just shot way back there. Much much bigger effect uh, for me here uh, in VR, I'm sure, than for you guys. It was just a well, dot getting to be a little bit smaller dot, but that was hilarious from my perspective. Oh, normalized. All right. Take two or three or four. I'm not sure what take we're on here. I'm going to clear the debugger when I have a chance. It's too much stuff in it. Uh, is that this one? Oh, paint guy? All right. All right, you're going down, Sphere. Oop, if I can hit you. Okay, that, that feels like the, the right vector, at least closer to the right vector. Um... You know, it's moving inverse to the direction I'm hitting it. Jeez, that's hard to hit sometimes. I guess that's what we're here to test. Okay, so... How can we adjust its movement to make this more interesting? I do think the, the coming towards us idea is good. Um... Also, uh, it probably it's probably worth trying having the enemy transition to the moving state after the hurt state, um, or at least having a dramatically abbreviated idle state. Uh, but let's actually just try having it switch to the moving state immediately after. And should we mess with the movement direction at all? So we could make sure that the enemy is always moving generally towards us with the dot product. Is that the dot product that tells us which direction a vector is pointing? Um, and I always get confused about how that works because math is not my strongest suit here. So if we have two vectors, if they're pointing towards each other, it's negative. Is that right? And in the same direction, positive? Um, so I'm just imagining in my head projecting the one vector onto the other. Because uh, that's, I don't know how I think about dot products. Real math people probably think about them better. So um, dot product. Uh, um, vector direction. So it doesn't have a direction because it's a scalar. Yeah, okay. Zone that is a scalar. It must not have a direction. But I mean, it tells us something about the direction. 
Oh my god. Could you just answer my question? Internet. What does the dot product of two vectors represent? Next instance of it. Hang on. Yeah, so the projection one, that's the one that works in my brain the best. Whatever, let's just try it. <laughs> oh, here we go. Malcolm told me. The dot product will be positive if they're pointing roughly the same direction negative. So we want it to be negative. Yeah. It's a hit. It could move in a direction in the plane perpendicular to the direction it was hit from to avoid getting hit again. So let me think about that. So the plane perpendicular... Yeah. Um, it could do that, but then also towards us. Because <laughs> I want it, I don't want it to keep going back forever. Uh, so we'd want it to, the only thing we would not want it to do is move straight back along that vector. Um, okay, here's what, here's what I'm, here's what I'm thinking. What if we have a range that we want the, the dot product to be on? So, or no, that doesn't make sense either because we don't, know like how long it's going to be unless we're dealing with normalized vectors um i mean i guess yeah we are dealing with norm we can deal with normalized vectors so we can do a min and max um so let's say const move der min uh so Negative one would be completely lined up, which we don't want. That's the thing we don't want to happen. So it would be smaller than negative one. Uh, this idea might be really stupid also. Um, <laughs> Cons to move their min, and it can't, well, it could be zero. Zero's fine-ish. We can move completely parallel um one or two times right so so while that while the length is less than min or or wait hang on uh let's scrap this let's scrap this we don't need constants let's just say or the uh, da, 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 da. We need the vector between um, the enemy and the player. How the heck are we going to get that? We need to tell the enemy about where the player is. Um, so the cheap way to do that, or one of the cheap ways to do that, would be to make an auto load where we set the player as an object there. We could also name the player something that we know is going to be there and then search the node tree for it, but I'm not crazy about that plan. Um, let's do the auto load thing. Um, we're just going to make an auto load called globals. Globals GD, which extends node and has a player variable and then we will have uh, our main script because I don't think we actually even have a script for the player not really is going to um, set it seems fine give the enemy a target node to attack Hey, Logan, welcome to the stream. I was just talking about you. I forget what I said, though. I, I it was probably good. <laughs> Give the enemy a target node to attack. Um, yeah, that's actually that's actually an even better idea. Malcolm, you are full of amazing ideas this morning. Maybe you're full of amazing ideas all the time. <laughs> but uh, this is your first time on the stream, so it's my first time experiencing it. Uh, all right. Uh, Let's let's do that. So we have, or that would work if I hadn't broken the um, the scene up into 
uh, a main scene and a world. So the player actually isn't in the world. The player is in the main scene. So to do your idea, we would have to do like editable children and then, or we could assign it from the script. Assigning it from the script is better. Um, yeah, if it was all in the same scene, we could just say like, put a property on the enemy node, which shouldn't be called new, node 3D, and like assign it to a node path that points at the, the player, which I guess we could still sort of do. It would just be like a node path that goes outside of the current node tree. Or, okay, or how about this idea? We assign the enemy to a group and then the main scene grabs all the all of the uh, nodes in that group and then tells them the node they should be attacking. <laughs> I think actually it was Logan. I think it was talking about Team Shovel and how we were going to do the global game jam. That totally was it. Okay, let's let's try this this new new idea. Um, so first of all, I'm going to change this to enemy now that I've noticed it was called Node 3D Enemy. Makes me think of the song from uh, Arcane, the Imagine Dragon song. That's an that's an awesome song. Uh, da, da, da. Call it Enemy. Um, and on the Enemy script, let's add a function. When I'm doing interfacey things, I like to do functions rather than properties. Although it's totally possible to do a property too, but we'll say set attack target um i don't know target and i guess the only thing that's important is that it's a node 3d so it can find it in space attack target equals target and declare that variable up here all right so the last bit of setup is we need to, um, so we need to loop over all of the enemies in the, uh, what is the method called? Something group, get nodes in group, uh, enemy. They'll say if enemy has method set attack target, I'll do enemy set attack target the player uh the player is player body did we give it a scene unique i guess we don't need to it's at the top level no it's not the top level we'll do um access as unique name player body all right so now the enemy is aware of the player and I can go back to my probably not good ideas involving dot products and say, um, let's grab the uh, target position uh, equals, or hang on. Um, we might not have the player. I mean, I guess because this is a prototype, we can assume we do, but we'll say, um, say var target position vector three, I like doing them like this for some reason, even though it really makes no difference. Uh, we'll say if attack target uh, does not equal null, then the target position equals attack target global position. So it'll, it, it'll attack towards the center if there is no um, player. And then we need to say, we'll keep generating it if it's not long enough or the um, dot product between uh, the the moving delta and the attack targets. Okay, um, moving delta dot. Oh, we don't just need the attack target. We need a uh, uh, um, say target vector. We need a vector pointing f to the target position. 
Let's target position minus the uh, our current position. So that would be um, global position. All right, now we have all the vectors we need. So moving delta uh, dot target vector, and we don't want it to be greater than zero, right? Because if it's positive, we're moving in roughly the same direction, which we don't want. We want them to be opposing. And ideally, we'd want it to not be very close to negative one. Oh, hang on, I need to normalize some things. Um, normalized, and moving delta is also not normalized. Um, let's just try this. Let's just see if this keeps the enemy moving towards the player. I just realized I was not uh, watching my own Discord. <laughs> I was in the Godot Discord. I'm, I'm not sure why. Let me get over to the stream channel just in case I'm missing some things that uh, Restream is not picking up. Let's scroll all the way down here. Okay. Um, so I forget what all the things we changed were. I think we changed something before this, but let's give this a try and kind of see what it ends up feeling like. Yeah, man. We are stuck. Is it that swap chain thing again? It is. Okay. I, I kind of want to look at this error again for a second. Um, no viewport was marked with use XR. How is that happening? Oh, I wonder if... Um, so I've been noticing this thing with uh, debugging Android. Uh, not, sometimes the script will crash with a fatal error, and it won't trigger the debugger. Sometimes it will, but sometimes it won't. So what I'm thinking happened here uh, is that I made a mistake in this code, which has um, caused this code not to run. Which sucks, because I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to get this info. Let me, let me try running the script, or running the game locally like not on the headset and see what I get invalid type in function set attack target in base the object derived class of argument one is not a subclass of the expected argument shouldn't it be I didn't I say no 3d XR tools player body is not a subclass of the expected argument um, no 3d I am just going to assume there's some weird GD script type hint bug here and retry that. Trying to assign variable value of type node to variable of type node 3D. Weird. Weird. It should definitely be a node 3D though because like we assigned it on a um, character body 3D. or And it's the player, which is also character body 3D. I, I don't know. Let's say Godot for GDScript type hint bug. There's certainly been plenty of those. And then we'll start XR. Yeah, it's expected. I don't have my Monado junk set up right now. Player body is a node. Oh, is it really? I didn't realize that. Uh, so yeah, I guess, okay, it was not a bug, it was not a bug, it was telling me something. The icon, though, made me think it was a character body. It's a node. Okay, all right. I should not trust icons. Um, 
So our type hints actually told us valuable information, which I was just about to write off because of all of the like GDScript type hint bugs that have been in Godot 4. Um, but he was actually totally right. Uh, so Malcolm says this should be character body dot kinematic body, which is a funny variable name given that there are no kinematic bodies left in Godot 4. But let me go. Um, let me go just double check in the script. Search for body. Oh, everything's going to say body because that's what this node is called. Kinematic body. All right, or kinematic node. Kinematic node. Is that what you put? So it's kinematic node, not kinematic body. All right. Let's uh, just run this locally again. All right, seems to be seems to be working. Uh, we will send it to the headset. Was this debugger five here telling me? Oh, okay, those errors got cleared. Must have been from the previous session. All right, what are you gonna do, little QB guy? Are you gonna come at me? You are going to not come at me. You are very much not coming at me. Yeah, it's in fact, it feels like it's doing the opposite. It is getting further away. Hmm. All right, my dot product idea was not good. Um, or at least I messed it up somehow. Okay, so let's look at this again. So the moving delta is where it's going to move to normalized. The target vector is a vector pointing from the enemy to the player normalized. Hey, Muhammad, welcome to the stream. I haven't been looking at any what the characters anyone has been getting. Muhammad's got a guy with kind of my hair going on, nothing on top. <laughs> Malcolm's rocking a shield. Oh, I'm I'm like a monk with a beard. Anyway, um, so we regenerate it if the length is less than move min, or the dot product is greater than zero. The sign is incorrect that it should be. I thought negative would mean that the vectors are pointing at each other. Or wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. No, no, I'm doing this wrong. Okay, so the target... Yeah, okay, you're right that the sign is incorrect, but it was because I was picturing this backwards. So I was picturing the target vector pointing out towards it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now, so now the vectors are both pointing in the same direction. Or wait, no. Uh, yeah, they're both pointing this way. Maybe what we should do is flip this one so that it fits my internal mental model global position so we're now pointing we're now pointing from the player to the uh, enemy so now we have two opposing vectors the movement vector and the player vector and we want to throw it out if it's greater than zero and ideally also less than um, a particular uh, value because we don't want them coming straight at us, but maybe it's fine too. I don't know. Let's give this a shot. Delta and target in the same direction. Yeah, yeah. No, you're you're right. I I I had drawn a picture, <laughs> and then had implemented my code differently than the picture. So I think I think the code is going to match the picture now. All right, come at me, come at me, enemy. Yep, he's coming vaguely in my direction. Let's see, uh, I'm just going to wait for him, see how close he gets. Well, now he's going that way. What are you going that way for? What are you going that way for? <laughs> okay, so here he's coming. That seems kind of away from me, dude. All right, now let's shoot him. Yeah, having him move after... Move rather than idle after I've shot him is definitely better.
Ooh, it is difficult to aim at a distance. Yeah. Okay, so this this enemy, uh, we do need to bound him. We need to put him in the bounding box. Um, this enemy is definitely going to teach me things in this prototype about uh, aiming. And that is good, because that's what I wanted to test. But it is definitely not going to teach me anything about how to make a compelling enemy, because this enemy is so uncompelling. This is like the boringest, <laughs> the boringest enemy ever. Uh... But luckily, that's not what this prototype is about. This prototype is about shooting with a weapon on top of your hand. And how does that feel? So I'm thinking we bound him, put him in a bounding box of some kind. And then, uh, and then make three of them or something and practice shooting. And I think that should get us close to answering the uh, the fundamental question that I want to answer with this prototype. Getting it to do what you want is an art. <laughs> oh, what was the bot? I didn't see the bot on YouTube. Uh, it got blocked via Restream. Uh... I'm streaming in too many places. Let me see if I can access the Dealey on YouTube. Oh, there we go. Omega 69. All right. I see him. I will block him. Restream didn't let him through to the other services, which is pretty interesting. So report. Uh, unwanted commercial content or spam. I think that qualifies report yeah I know as fast as I'm reporting these streamers or streamers spammers more are appearing but I gotta do my part I gotta chip in oh man there's some more up at the top yeah none of these made it um, into restream just onto YouTube All right, I've reported four comments here. That looks like all the ones I can see in the back scroll here. Okay. <laughs> I mean, getting a date is nice, but you only stream once per week for two hours. <laughs> The clean says, forget about girls. Hook me up with that AI. <laughs> You're asking how I learned Python? So we're, we're actually uh, coding in GDScript here, which looks a lot like Python. Uh, I don't remember how I learned Python. I think I just started learning. And I, I learned Python uh, back when it was uh, 1.5 something. Uh, so quite a long time ago. In the, I think that would have been around, geez, how long ago would that have been? Either the late 90s or early 2000s is. Um, when was Python 1.5 released? And that was like the version of Python it felt like forever. Like it was like 1.5.2 for a million years, or at least that's what it felt like at the time. Um, yeah, 1.5.2, that was my version, man. Released 1998. So I guess I, I probably learned it in, in like 98, 99 era. Um, yeah, because if it ended support in 1999 I and I was on 1.5.2, um, that would have definitely been in that kind of two years or maybe like more like one year, year and a half. Or maybe my distro that I was using. I was, think I was using Red Hat uh, 5.2 at the time. When did Red Hat 5.2 come out? Or I want release date. Oh, actually, here we go. We can go to Red Hat Linux. 
Red Hat 5.2. Yeah, November 1998. So I was using Red Hat 5.2, rocking out the Python 1.5. Um, I don't think I even used GNOME then, GNOME Technology Preview. I think I was using a window manager called IceWM. Ah, oh, those were the days. Those were the days. I guess the, the short version is I, I, I have no idea how I learned Python. <laughs> but I have been, I have been uh, uh, trying to teach my daughter some programming, and we got this like Learn Python for Kids book, uh, and we've been slowly going through it. I don't think she's really getting a lot of the programming, but she's learning good computer skills. Uh, just following the instructions in the book and typing the things in and uh, getting experience with the keyboard and like where menus are and stuff. But um, yeah, Python's a good a good language to learn. <laughs> the AI won't complain, right? <laughs> uh, all right. So what was I even doing? We were going to constrain it to a bounding box is what we were going to do. Uh, oh, and before I do that, let me commit what we've got. This is this is a good this is a good interim thing to commit. Um, and I never ended up using that global script. Let's just remove it. Oh, okay, fine. It never was even in Git to begin with. This all looks good. Um, add or uh, can hurt enemy and it vaguely seeks to your position. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so I think we can set the bounding box on the enemy in a way similar to how we set the target uh, attack target. No, no, I want to get into VR this year, which headset do you guys recommend? I can wait some months if it's worth it. So uh, the best headset to get right now, uh, or actually, okay, it's, it's the best headset to get right now, in my opinion, is the Quest 2. Uh, the Pico 4, though, isn't a terrible option, especially if you're going to be doing um, PC VR rather than content on the headset. Uh, they have much less content, although they have some of the same stuff. Walkabout Mini Golf, I'm pretty sure, is available on the Pico, uh, and that's a great game. I was playing it with Logan last night. Um, but uh, uh, the Pico has better hardware than the the Quest 2, so if you're going to be just connecting it to your machine to play Steam games, um, that is a solid choice. However, uh, it has been confirmed that the Quest 3 is releasing this year, probably towards the end of the year, uh, usually they do um, the Meta Connect in like October ish, um, so that's probably when it's going to be released, uh, unless like you know technology things happen, it could get delayed. But the Quest Three is probably the best headset to get in 2023, even though it's not out yet. Uh, getting the Quest Two, I mean, is the best right now, like just as far as software you can try. Um, but yeah, the Quest Three is coming soon. I have the Quest. Pro also, but it's crazy expensive and isn't even that nice. <laughs> so I don't recommend it. The uh, the Quest 2 now, the Quest 3 at the end of the year. They say that due to inflation and the fact that Meta didn't get their profits back from the store price of the Quest 3 will be expensive. Uh, I mean, so Zuckerberg said that it's going to cost between 300 and 500. Um, so unless he, unless he changes his mind about that, but uh, the... Uh, uh, that's what that's that's what has been said. Uh, I think uh, what's his face, the CTO guy, uh, Boz, uh, is the one who said that the Quest Three is coming in 2023, and uh, Zuckerberg is the one who said it's going to be between 300 and 500. Um, do I prefer the Quest Two over Pro? The Quest Two is much more comfortable for me. Although I did just get this strap yesterday, and I'm excited about that, making it more comfortable. This thing has just been an insane trial of a. Uh, 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 of just discomfort. So uh, I was expecting it to be more comfortable because everyone always says this this halo strap is more comfortable. Um, but it is not for me because uh, in order for the picture to come in clear for my eyes, for however my head is shaped, I have to tilt it way down. Um, and the the there's no hinge on the Quest Pro. It's like fixed here. On the Quest 2, you, you can tilt it 
And so like for my face or eyes or whatever it is, I can put the thing on and then just tilt it down and it's perfect. And I have like the, the elite strap with the battery in back. So it's like nicely balanced. Um, and then when I'm doing development, I can rest the quest two on my head like this. I can't do that with the quest pro cause there's nothing on the bottom. Um, I would be resting like the lenses on my head which I don't want to do. So <laughs> the, the quest, the quest two is like what I use for development. And, uh, when I'm, I don't know, I'm sick of this thing hurting my head, but the, the, uh, lenses on the quest pro are amazingly clear. The color on the quest pro is so much better. When I went over to my pa's house over, um, over uh, Christmas, and I was playing, you know, Half Life Alex and all this other stuff we were trying on his new gaming PC. Uh, you know, definitely better on the Quest Pro, like the graphical fidelity, uh, and there's a slightly wider uh, field of view on the Quest Pro. I just it squishes the hell out of my face, and I have to wear it in this weird way. So I don't know. I, I think this strap, this strap might fix it for me, and then I might be switching to using the Pro more often. Um, but yeah, the, the, oh, and the controllers, dude, the controllers on the Quest Pro are amazing. So, I mean, there's a lot of technical things on it that are better. I just wish it didn't hurt my, my head. Uh, that's really it. What did I miss here? Oh, I was talking about, uh, oh, so developing on the Pico 4. I don't have a Pico 4, uh, but it is very similar in my understanding to the, um, the, uh, uh, the Quest. And there is already a uh, loader plugin that you can get for Godot 4 to uh, run stuff on the Pico 4. My expectation is that developing on the Pico 4 should be about the same as developing for the Quest with like maybe less proprietary APIs and stuff because the Quest has like uh, its API for avatars and uh, uh, it has this interaction API I've never used and I don't know, all this different stuff. Um, but I, I would expect it to be very... Uh, similar, Vladislav. Oh man, I, I I don't read Russian very often. Gala 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 Borod Gala Borodko Gala Borodko, something like that. Sorry, I probably butchered your name. <laughs> uh, what else did I miss? Um, prices are different. It's wild that the Quest Two is more comfortable for me. Yeah, I mean, well, it's it's so subjective, right? Because everyone's head is shaped different, and your eyes are positioned differently, and all these kind of things. Um, Quest 2 is around 2,500 zloty here, while the average pay is about, oof, yeah, that is, uh, that is intense. I can easily afford it, but maybe waiting for 3 will be the better option. Let's see if 3 will be better than Pro. 3 should have the pros of both 2 and Pro. So, uh, 3 is probably going to be better than Pro in a bunch of ways. So the rumors, which surprisingly turned out to be really accurate, by the way, the leaks and rumors and stuff, um, for the Pro, they were like almost spot on, except the Pro doesn't have a depth sensor. And the story is, it actually did have a depth sensor and they, they removed it from the product at the last moment. It's so like the, the rumors were spot on. Anyway, the rumors are that the um, the Quest 3 will have the next generation of the Snapdragon XR chip. So it will probably be on the order of twice as fast processor and GPU wise than the Quest Pro and the Quest 2 because the Quest Pro and the Quest 2 both use the same uh, system on a chip, the Snapdragon XR 2 Gen 2 or whatever the hell it's called. Um, so the Quest 3 will be better in that way, but uh, it probably won't include these controllers. And it probably, uh, well, I don't know, who knows how the, the strap design and everything's going to be. Um, but the reason that the Quest 2 is the way the Quest 2 is, is for like cost cutting reasons. It's so, like the, the Pro has the battery in the strap, which apparently is more expensive to manufacture for some reason. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, there there will definitely be things better about the three than the pro, but the pro will probably still have some stuff uh, better than the better than the three. The clean can you can use the pro controllers with the Quest Two? Yes, you can. I haven't tried it yet though. I should because the controllers are amazing. The controllers on their own cost like three hundred dollars, so it's like buying another headset for the cost of the controllers. Probably not all the pros of the Quest Pro. They want to keep some features. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, the RGB camera. I'm willing to bet. I would bet that the RGB camera is going to be in the Quest 3 because the cost increase for making the cam... Because, okay, so the um, the Pro has four tracking cameras, which are black and white, and then one color camera. 
in the front that it uses to colorize the black and white picture that it's getting from the black and white cameras. So all the difference is to get the RGB pass through is adding like a single camera on the front. Um, so the, the cost there isn't that high. And if Meta wants to move to like uh, supporting um, more AR apps and getting closer to like the AR glasses super future, it probably makes sense for them to put the, uh, uh, the RGB cameras on there. Yeah, exactly what Malcolm is saying. They'll probably add the color camera to the Quest 3 because they're pushing this reality. And it shouldn't cost that much, honestly. Like, how much does a webcam cost? My webcam works great, and I think I paid 50 bucks for it, you know? Um, and I'm sure they can get something cheaper than 50 bucks because they're, you know, manufacturers or whatever. Please explain his method object. I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to, uh, Mohammed. I might be, I might have just gotten lost in this conversation. And welcome to the stream, bad tunes. Did I miss welcoming anyone else? I got carried away. I was on a rant there. I need to, I need to look at the back scroll a little bit here, orient myself, calm down. Is object method in Python. Uh, are you talking about like the way that I'm doing fake interfaces with the um with this where I'm like checking if uh an object has a method and then calling it? Hey Dud, welcome to the stream. Oh, Dud got a pretty sweet character with a tall shield. Oh, Smoloki, I hadn't looked at your character yet with the mohawk. Bad tunes, bad tunes is an orc with a crown and braids. That's a nice combination. Good combo there. Uh, Smoky, AR via the HMD is still weird to, to me. Glasses like uh, Enreal, Rokid seem way more convenient, but I guess the power, yeah. So I mean, the, um, yeah, I think we're just a way, a way out from the good technology for Enreal though. Have you tried AR via an HMD though? It is surprisingly compelling. Uh, I had never really done AR on anything, like not on a HoloLens or whatever, but doing the AR experiences on the Quest Pro was pretty cool. I, I was surprisingly um, surprisingly compelled, we'll say, by it. I did, uh, there's a an AR mixed reality experience from uh, the I Expect You to Die people, where you're doing like an I Expect You to Die puzzle in your room, and like there's... Uh, uh, some like pipes and things in the wall you need to mess around with and this thing rises out of your floor and it's, it, it was really compelling and there's a demo thing where you have like this creature that you're like looking for and then you're like erasing your walls and seeing out into this other world which was pretty compelling too I uh, it's cool it's really cool um, by the way I hear that Apple has some plans for VR too yeah I don't know we'll see what Apple does odds are it's going to be something quite different oh yeah so the quest one i mean the quest one's still a great headset um i have a quest one somewhere oh i borrowed it to a friend actually uh and my my pa's still playing on his quest one it was actually kind of weird buying the quest two because i felt like i kind of just got this quest one but i don't know i'm used to now just buying lots of headsets <laughs> oh yeah Definitely, like, buying the Quest 2 right now is kind of a weird thing to do. I mean, despite the fact that it's still a great headset and there's still lots of great software, um, it, like, for the cost, like, they raised the cost by 100 bucks, and, like, we know the Quest 3 is coming really soon, and probably because it's going to have a new processor, there's going to be a big break in, like, games that only work on the Quest 3 versus working on both the Quest 3 and the Quest 2. Like, once you get that extra CPU and GPU, are developers really going to want to scale their games back to work on the older headsets? Apple don't like Vulkan. Yeah, the, f the fact that they haven't participated with OpenXR at all up until this point makes me think they are just not going to. Do we think Apple headset will support WebXR? Yes, we do. We do. Um... I forget exactly what the story was uh, with that, but I remember uh, a recent article about um, Apple improving its WebXR support, I think, for AR on its smartphones. Um, and so if they're continuing to invest in WebXR for their existing iOS phones, odds are they're going to bring it to their AR goggles too. 
I don't think Vulkan is required for OpenXR. Is it? It is not. I'm pretty sure I've seen OpenGL and D3D apps using OpenXR. Yes, absolutely. So uh, OpenXR works with Godot 3, which is OpenGL, and the HoloLens will only work with Direct3D. Or is it the HoloLens? Or is, which, which, one, which one's Microsoft's one? Is that the HoloLens or is that... Yeah, that is, because I always get it confused with all those other AR things that I've never had. Guys, I have been talking like crazy and not developing. <laughs> And we're already hit the time when I usually stop. Um, what were we doing? Let me, uh, did I make that commit? I guess I did. Okay, so uh, I guess what I'm going to say for the project, we'll keep chatting for a little bit, but <laughs> what I'll say for the project is um, we made some great progress. I think the main thing, and I'll add this to my notes. Uh, do I have my notes open anywhere? I guess I don't. Let me bring my notes over. Uh, is that we need to add the bounding box and a couple of enemies. And then I think I'm actually going to send the project to a couple of people. Logan, if you're still here, I'm totally going to send it to you. Uh, I'm going to send it to my pa. I'm going to send it to everyone I know who's got uh, uh, VR and just see like what it feels like to shoot from your wrists. Um, that is my next steps for that prototype. Uh, where the heck are my notes? And I'll send this over to this screen. Set up a target to shoot. Yay! Okay, so um, put target in bounding box. Uh, put three of them on there. <laughs> send to folks to play test. All right. All right, what is everyone saying over in the chat? We'll chat for a couple more minutes, and then, uh, and then we, will, we will wind the stream down. Interesting. WebXR kind of circumvents Apple's walled garden. Do they do, if they do support it, that could be huge. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and and uh, that's also like kind of my main motivation originally for getting into WebXR was that it circumvented uh, Quest's walled garden. Um, and it'll be interesting if everyone ends up supporting WebXR even a little bit even if it's not a great experience, but if it's supported everywhere, I mean, I, I kind of feel like that's that's where the metaverse is going to, the real metaverse, not the, you know, weird uh, 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 Web3 crypto craziness that some people think the metaverse is. <laughs> not that, but like the real, like, you know, VR internet uh, could could come from. No, no, they better support it and they better open up to Vulcan. They're not going to open up to Vulcan. I just, it's not going to happen. They have metal. They're invested in metal. I think it's more likely that Godot will one day add a true metal backend than Apple will ever support Vulcan. Um, I mean, right now, Godot uh, is supporting Apple on metal by using Molten VK, which transforms, you know, Vulcan API calls to metal API calls. Um, but yeah, maybe one day uh, someone will create a true metal backend, and that's going to happen way before Apple ever comes around. Never thought about this, but does Godot 4 use Molten VK? Yes, it does. Um, it uses Molten VK uh, in Godot 4, and I think it just uses, I think it just uses uses OpenGL uh, legacy OpenGL support in Godot 3. Although I'm not 100% about that. It could use Angle and and do uh, uh, metal that way. I'm not sure. Well, anyway, guys, it's great to be back with you, to be hanging out and streaming. This was a super fun stream. We made some progress. It was great chatting with everyone. Thanks so much for all of your help. You guys always help me with my project when I'm working on it. Um, Dud says, Godot 4 could become a great environment to develop Web WebXR as better tools are needed. I hope so. Um, yeah, and speaking as the maintainer of the WebXR module in Godot 4, I would love for it to be a... a uh, a good platform for for WebXR. I think the main problems uh, for using Godot for WebXR are, are still performance and um, just like uh, you know being big build, big builds. But I think we can address both of those things. Um, oh, and I guess the fact that we don't support like all of the API either too. We we need to expand a little bit there. Mostly on the AR end, we support most of the VR um, APIs. If Godot eventually gets WebGPU support, it could just use WebGPU as a metal backend. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting idea too. So someone is working on WebGPU support. 
Uh, I forget who it was. I only heard about it like in passing because there isn't an open PR for it, uh, or at least not that I've seen. Um, but someone is working on web GPU support. Um, and I expect that will be really interesting. Uh, I didn't look at how they're doing it again because I don't think there's an open PR, but, um, web GPU could conceivably be a render device backend, uh, just like Vulkan and direct 3d are, uh, which would be cool. We could maybe use like the higher end renderers on the web, which I'd be curious to see how that goes, but yeah, web GPU support will definitely happen someday in, in Godot for sure. Anyway, thanks again, folks. I hope you have a great weekend. And uh, yeah, I'll see you on Discord and in a week on the stream again. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.